Thank you very much. This is really so amazing. I mean, it's five o'clock on a Friday afternoon. They've got free beer outside, and you're all sitting in here. I mean, <laughs> that's also our apology for this very boastful title. We're very sorry. We knew had we had a very powerful enemy, beer, and um, especially Bavaria. Um, you shouldn't take it lightly with that one. So what we're talking about is we're calling it the future of content management, but actually we're talking a lot about NEOS. We're talking about positioning, and um, so who are we? This is obviously me. So he made the slides, and not, it's not my fault that I'm coming first. Um, and so my specialty is brand and strategy consulting. This is the other guy, um, brilliant Rasmus. He's got an, um, himself a designer by training, and also kind of the mastermind behind the NEOS UX, as I guess most of you know. Um, we tried thinking about this on our own and that didn't work, so we asked a lot of other people. And those are a lot of um, very good analysts and people who have published consistently over the years on this, uh, on this subject of content management and where this market is moving, um, both of us together and independently we've been talking to them and have been in a dialogue with them in workshops and so on. Looking at the future and what you're going to hear from now on uh, in the next 260 minutes, in <laughs> the next 40 minutes is that uh, all the sense we could make from what they were saying, so that is obviously our fault, not theirs. So the plot, the, what we're trying to do is at first we're talking about the state of the CMS market as we see it, as we understand it, we're going to draw on some of the publications by the major analytics houses, but we're not going to bore you with uh, too much of that. Um, then we'll look at strategic options from our point of view. Which way could NEOS go to gain more market share? What kind of positioning would be possible for it? Then we'll look at two major trends. And finally, we'll try to translate that into what that means for NEOS. And finally, some very basic uh, next steps. So what's the immediate thing to do then? Okay, now, first off, the state of the CMS market. As you all know, there is um, a lot of uh, companies out there that are selling their analysis to uh, clients, which are major companies buying intelligence to make better purchase decisions. And um, this one is probably the most powerful graphic and diagram there is out there. Um, it is probably that powerful because it is that stupid. It is very flat, as you can see. It just has four sectors, and it takes a lot of vendors, um, which qualify to get in there by having a certain amount of turnover. And then they say, well, those upright there are very um, in the corner of innovation, and they're also pretty big, so they must be leaders, and so on. So everybody else, basically, outside of the top right uh, box, is a loser, to some extent. Um, and they know, of course. So everybody's trying to get up there. So if you're on the top left, you're, only, you're practically already dead. And um, this, uh, this is a very intense struggle between them. And you see a lot of names in there where you would say, well, okay, but Oracle, really? IBM, hmm, yeah, well, they bought something some time ago. So this is not very clear cut. It doesn't tell you a lot about the CMS market as you and I and everybody here in the room perceives it. Because when we think of CMSs, you don't think of IBM first and foremost, I guess. And that is not only a question of the market segment, you end, it's also a question of how do you um, perceive the whole area of a CMS? Is it just a function within some bigger um, suite or is it something more specialized? So there's another one, this is called the hype cycle. And um, I borrowed this from Patrick, Patrick Lobacher over there, um, a presentation last year about strategy at the T3Con. And um, very quickly, if you haven't seen this before, what this is about is um, here in the very beginning, somebody, let's say, will not talk about CMS, somebody saw, hears something about 3D printing 10 years ago. And they say, yay, 3D printing, I want to have this. And then they buy something, and they are really disappointed that it doesn't work. And then they fall down to this point, and then suddenly they appear somewhere here when then finally a product comes out that really works. So this is probably 10 years ago, and this is somewhere where we are today. 
And the same thing happens with a lot of features and functionalities in CMSs. And this whole hype cycle here by Gartner is um, full of um, functions that when you look at them, a lot of them will probably never come about. You have, might have not even heard about them. But Gartner makes a good job of recording all of those uh, hypes that they hear. So what you see here is all the companies in there, the vendors, are competing very hard for market share by inventing stuff with great names that nobody uses. This is a quote, by the way, by Tim Walters. <laughs> so what's happening, if you turn that thing upside down is, I had to draw this myself, couldn't find it anywhere to steal it from. Um, this is, um, you, you can imagine that as, as such. There is a market in the beginning, and, um, and all the CMSs are more or less alike. That is when that whole thing is totally flat. And then some of them start to grow, and they go into deeper specialization. So what they do is they develop pockets. They're called pockets of specialization. And there are other things that are following them. And what this is doing, over time, it is breaking up a genre like CMS into smaller segments. So that things like Contentful and Gather Content and Woodwing go on the content collection side, or delivery go probably into functions like or offerings like content delivery networks, and so forth, and so on. So that means we have a largely disintegrated, disintegrating, drifting apart market. There is not the, the, the bracket of a, of a CMS, what a CMS is, is no longer that powerful. So strategic options. What can we do about this? What can NEOs do about it? Where can it go? First off, the original plan for NEOS was to be a version, more or less, of Type 3 and um, to replace the original product. As we all know in this room and probably beyond it, that is not what's going to happen anytime soon because people learned along the way and built an entirely different system which is good at other things, but it's also not trying to do everything that Type, that type 3 has done and it cannot deliver that in any meaningful time frame. So it must concentrate on things it can do and things it will not do. It will have to take a fresh take at that. So that is the Me Too strategy, trying to become one of those um, CMS offerings, just doing the same as everybody else does. We'll look at that, how, how big the, how good the chances of that are later on. Then there is a niche product possibility. Imagine you find a niche in the market and you stick to it. And actually, that's how CMSs were invented in the first place. I have this, um, probably not all of you know that, but the FDA um, is doing the certification of pharmaceuticals in the United States. And um, a few guys at IBM found out that um, all those pharmaceutics uh, companies had a huge problem with storing and versioning all the documentation they use for the FDA process. So they created a company called Documentum servicing them. And that was actually the first company that was only specializing on the management of content. And in a way, that was a very small niche, but also very powerful, because the pain those certain pharmaceuticals felt was so big that they needed to find a solution for that, and there was Documentum to help them. So Neos, in turn, could do something like that. Try to find a niche where nobody else is concentrating on, where the pain is intense and, um, and, and profit can be made, and look at that. Alas, somebody please come up with a niche. So another one would be piggybacking to the market, and that would be the whole thing about trying to become a replacement for the original Type 3 thing, um, which obviously again leads into the direction of the Me Too product, or a retake, if you look at that, maybe a, a modern CMS will be something different with a smaller feature set. There is another version of the piggyback thing, that is, um, you could cling to an already successful system, like Magento, and integrate with it on to a much larger and deeper extent, or something else, it doesn't really matter, as long it has, as it has already great market share and no other integrations on the same level. Or you could do like, or you go for something new and rising, like Contentful, and you say, okay, we integrate with them, we use them as a content collection a tool, and integrate with their output. Or you could do a third version of piggybacking. You could do as Contentful again does, 
they say they specialize on, the, um, on, on creating content for mobile and collecting content for mobile, or as Adobe does with um, the software that was formerly known as Day, and um, that is they highlight the whole point about personalization, which is the big theme at the moment anyway. So how do you prioritize? Well, there's quite a lot of things that you have to look at. As I said before, if you look at the, at the niche product, then there is one big problem we don't know. We, don't have, we haven't found the niche, unless somebody out here or somewhere else comes up with a niche. So there are constraints. I'm not going to go through the whole table, but you get the picture. Um, there are a lot of different variants. And of course, everybody here, being a player in the market, has the option to go after one of them. Toward this morning, we heard by uh, your brother Stefan about um, the, the whole idea of integrating with commerce. So that would be one of the piggyback strategies. And others will be needed. It is not just one approach. Anyway, for the two eggheads that we are, um, the, the trend about using, um, the, uh, using more of a, a theme, something, a paradigm in the market, is the most attractive one. And we'll try to explain to you why. All right, so uh, on our quest uh, to form and formulate a product strategy for, uh, for NEOS, we've uh, looked deeper into two very big agendas uh, currently uh, in the market. And those are the ones of personalization and cope. And uh, um, I'd like to go through both of them to look at the advantages and disadvantages of, of both of them. So if we start with COPE, COPE stands for Create Once and Publish Everywhere. Um, and um, this is basically about how to manage multi-channel content publishing. So you take apart the content uh, from all the output formats, and then you make it possible uh, to reuse that content uh, on many different devices and on many different channels. So in essence, you kind of center the content and then you can spread it out to all of the different channels that you want to reuse the content for. That's the idea. Uh, the term COPE is uh, often accredited to uh, National Public Radio uh, in the US uh, or NPR. This is their uh, technical architecture, which I understand absolutely nothing about, uh, but it's a nice picture. Um, <laughs> I guess some of you could uh, more easily explain that to me, but anyway, uh, there's no doubt that there's lots of things that you need to, to handle technically for that to, to actually work uh, in a great way. Um, and again, COPE is just really about getting content out to all of your channels. So you cannot not be multi-channel today, you're always multi-channel because your content will always be aggregated and it will be reused in all kinds of uh, scenarios that you don't have complete control over. So you need to create content that is, that is able uh, to live on many different devices, such as the mobile, for example. You also need to be able to reuse the content in, in printed matter. Uh, today, many organizations use a web-first uh, strategy when they create their content and then they reuse some of it in repurposed ways on their analog media. Or <clears throat> what if your uh, refrigerator needs your content? Uh, it might not happen uh, today, but the whole internet of things is coming and uh, all the devices need uh, to be able to pull in content in a, in a good way um, and display that in many different ways. Or in car systems, of course, what if your car needs to speak out uh, the content that you wrote once for your website. How do you handle that? And finally, what if content needs to work beyond your control? Uh, this is a great example of that. This is a fan-produced um, app uh, using the NPR uh, content feed. So they uh, distribute their content openly so that everyone can reuse that and tell new stories by combining their, uh, their content in many different ways. <clears throat> so this is all about uh, the race to keep all the channels up to date. That's a very important part of COPE as well, uh, because outdated information 
is basically killing us. It's very, very, very big problem in, in many sectors that you uh, let your users experience outdated content. That's absolutely horrible in many scenarios. And also, uh, it costs a fortune to actually update your content on many different channels and keep that in sync. We do see clients who have um, the capacity or the resources to keep uh, many different versions of content up to date on many different channels, but for a lot of clients that's just not possible in terms of the financial side to it. <laughs> so on the other hand, if we look at personalization, what is that? So what's important to understand about the whole mantra about personalization is first and foremost that it's content curated for you as individuals. So this is not about uh, persona-based content, for example. It's not about uh, differentiated content uh, for specific target groups where you take a whole group of people and then uh, you do variations of the same core message. Instead, uh, it's really for uh, curating for the individual, just like Facebook does. Which is why uh, you can only uh, apply personalization methods by uh, using a computer to do the final curation. Um, it took me a while to actually understand this quite simple fact, but of course you cannot ask, uh, um, you cannot ask a, 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 a marketing department to do personalized content for all of their individual clients. That's just not possible if you have more than 10 clients. <clears throat> so what's needed to achieve personalization? Uh, first and foremost, you need the actual data about the individuals, otherwise you are not able to create personalization. That's a, on a very basic level, but still you need to remember that. So you can only do that through profiling or through asking your users to log in. You also need the conditions um, so that you create rules uh, on, uh, about how to display what content. So if you look at something like Sitecore, for example, this is their interface to creating their, those conditions that will then end up in personalized content experiences. And uh, lastly, you need the actual content variants. So you actually need to produce all kinds of variants that are combinable in order to produce that curated, personalized experience. And finally, personalization ends up in uh, that's the, the dream and the hope of personalization, at least in more relevant end-user uh, content experiences. So uh, if we kind of look at those two trends uh, in opposition to each other, just for the fun of it, we can see uh, that some of the vendors are focusing heavily on, uh, on personalization. You have vendors like Sitecore and Acquia with their Lyft uh, product, and Adobe Web Experience Manager and, and things like Hippo CMS that are really running as fast as they can towards personalization and achieving that well. On the other hand, you see a whole new group of systems that actually also call themselves CMSs, uh, such as Contentful and Prismic and uh, Gather Content and Woodwings um, uh, Content Station. Content Station has been around for a really long time, but no one kind of discovered that for some weird reason. So, the big question here, when we go back to actually formulating a new product strategy for NEARS, and, and we're looking at these two major trends, is whether we want to focus on automation, because automation is needed if we are to achieve personalization, or if we want to focus more on creating quality content. And so it's all about priorities, and though targeting uh, gets better through personalization, that's definitely what personalization will help us all achieve. Um, but given that, uh, you still need to create quality content. And value, we believe, is created by human beings creating that content. You cannot automate that in any way. So we kind of stood in this situation looking at those two trends and said, okay, do we want to focus on automation, which is uh, basically data-centric, or the human-centric part of it, which is the creation of content. And we chose to, to suggest um, 
a product vision that focuses more on cope or that puts uh, cope as a, an approach before personalization. So we believe that's the more important part for, for NEOS. Personalization is still important, we'll achieve great things with it, but uh, it's a huge amount of work to actually make it, to make it work well, and almost no one has, has done that in the world. Uh, on the other hand, we have a product very well suited for a Coke approach. <laughs> okay, so if you're anything like me, you might feel like this. Because when, when Russ told me about this for the first time, I was going, create once, publish everywhere. I think I heard this before, in a different way, probably. So, one of these ways, for example, for at least 15 years. And I know there are areas in the in industries like publishing legal texts and stuff where this is um, the, the rule, the norm, not the exception. Um, if you discovered the last meme here, then you made it to the end of the slide, by the way. Um, so, all of these exist, all of these have been pushed in the market. So, what's different? Why, why is this something that's worth pursuing and that's interesting now, or more interesting? Because something else is happening. What we're looking at is, we're looking at automation now targeting digital marketing, and that is new. That is what all these CMS vendors are talking about with personalization. We didn't have that before. We're also in a very different situation than even five to ten years ago. Because if you've ever been in my shoes, um, sitting there with a client and telling them it would make perfect sense for them to collect all the content they have and put it in a CMS regardless of whether they're going to publish it on their website or maybe in print or something else, just to have it in one place for God's sake, finally. Um, they will tell you no, or they used to tell you no, because that was the web, and the web was young and evil and not sure what's, where it's going to go and you know that kind of stuff. But that is over. Because right now when you go to a client and they tell you that, you go, but you know what, if I look at your website, I think the most, the best of, of content that you have is already in there. You don't have a better place where you store all your stuff. So why not get the rest over there and work it from there? And that works. I tried it. You should try it too. So another reason is, as we indicated earlier, why this now makes more sense than all these other buzzwords uh, five to ten years ago is that we have a lot more channels and we're getting more channels as we go. Um, especially with new displays, with stuff that speaks to us, with the IoT um, revolution and so on, that is also a second bump in the hype cycle. Um, and all of that needs synchronized and controlled content. And that is new. And there is a new meme, it is just a meme, to help us with that, to cope with that problem. All right, so that was the entire background story or a, a small portion of what, uh, what we've been uh, talking a lot about, Daniel and I, and uh, that uh, I've been spending the past couple of years on actually talking with lots and lots of people about. So um, coming from that background story, we now need to actually reformulate the product strategy for NEOS because NEOS was, uh, from its inception date, uh, in a completely other environment where we didn't have many of, the, of these themes, they weren't relevant at all or didn't exist as, as themes at all uh, back then. Uh, so we need to make sure that we continuously keep the product up to date and relevant. So we, we would like to suggest that we take COPE as a content, as an answer it's 17, to... 30. Thank you. Now I know what the time is. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so ne the next thing that will happen is definitely that I'll get a text on the screen from my wife or something like that. But uh, we, we, should take, uh, we should take COPE as an answer to the multi-channel struggle of keeping content up to date on many different channels and see NEOS as what we like to call the content mix deck. And I'll explain that a bit later. 
Um, so what's important here is that this is a, a Aeneas version of COPE because if we just take COPE as invented by National Public Radio or, or many of the others who have, have, have used COPE as a methodology, uh, we can't apply that directly to Aeneas, it just doesn't fit. So we need to work with the concept of COPE um, in a way that fits our product. So we think of, of, uh, of the mix deck, the DJ mix deck here and uh, see that this is how we think of, of editors uh, using a content management system in the future. So, as a DJ, you have inputs, uh, music coming from many different sources, and then you control it on your mix deck, and then you send it out again. Uh, so if we take that as a metaphor, uh, it's quite useful when we're thinking about multi-channel. So on the, on the left side here, you have all of the uh, input channels, or all of the input types. You have images, you have product data, and you have also things like freeform, unstructured content, like what you uh, write in a Word document or something like that. And you also have press releases and reviews and whatnot. And on the other, on the other side here, over to the right, you have all the, the channels that you want to publish to. And there are lots of them and lots of different combinations of them. And we shouldn't propose any specific combination with Nias, but rather just focus on the thing in the middle that lets you take in all kinds of different content and spit it out again in many different ways. So we like to think of Nias as a mix deck for all types of content, although they can be both structured or unstructured, that's an important point, and, and to be published everywhere. Um, we think in the future, Nia should basically, un underneath everything, ask you th three different questions. So you should consider three different things when you work with a content management solution using Nia's. And one is, where does your content come from? Come from many different places. And two, where does your content go? And thirdly, which is very specific to Nia's, uh, what variants of the content do you need? This is where we apply the dimensions concept of, of Nia's. So this is not only about translation, of course, but could also be differentiated content in many different ways. So what is a COPE CMS? If we were to apply that as a product strategy, what does that mean? It means something both for content creation and content curation. It's pretty important to distinguish between the two. And through a lot of the research that we have done, and speaking to all the people that Daniel mentioned earlier, Many, many of them have said you also need to remember that the curation part is becoming more and more important because we are creating content in all kinds of different ways using all kinds of different tools and content creation is basically coming, becoming a commodity. On the other hand, you need to fit that together in many different ways and tell new stories with it through curation, which is increasingly important. So content creation <clears throat> This is the basic way uh, we do this in Neos in the raw content editing mode. We split up the content in very small modules, or uh, we en enable that, um, <clears throat> and make uh, it possible to actually reuse the content in different ways. Or, uh, in this instance, you create more unstructured content. So we are always talking about, con or about uh, structured content being better, but we also have to remember that most editors really prefer to create rather unstructured content. But it's often said that unstructured content is not reusable across channels, which is actually not true, and I think we've proven that pretty well with Nias already, that you can take bits and pieces of unstructured content and then reuse that elsewhere. And then we have the preview central um, in Nias. And when we speak to other to agencies and some of the vendors, they say, okay, our preview is a lie, you shouldn't go there, because it, it will always be an unrealistic um, simulation of an end user experience. It will always be different in the end, with different browsers, different devices, different uh, scenarios altogether. But what this does is that it teaches editors over time to work with content in a new way where they immediately understand that, okay, my content will, uh, will live in many different channels and will have to work in many different ways. So the Preview Central is really great for teaching editors slowly over the next 
years to get accustomed to working with content in this new way. If we look at some of the other vendors that are not doing any kind of preview, they are asking editors to be uh, creative with their content in very, very abstract ways without getting a picture of the final output for the end user. We think that's an important point. And when we then, then look at content curation, on the other hand, this is where in-place editing in NIAS comes extremely handy. Because uh, if you just apply COPE as a method to just spit out the exact same content to all your channels, you'll end up in, in very, very strange, overly generic uh, user experiences. Um, what we can do with in-place editing is to curate the content, whether it's produced in NIAS or in other systems that uh, will be channeled into NIAS, then you can actually mix and match things, and you can take content from all kinds of different sources, put it together uh, one channel at a time, and make a great user experience out of that. Uh, on the other hand, we have the content dimensions concept in NIAS, where uh, you can also use that to curate different variations of the same content in different ways per channel, which is um, definitely needed because handling dimensions for an editor is not going to be easy at all. It's, it's a quite abstract concept that you have to think about your content being uh, coming in different uh, versions. So what are the next steps for NIAS if we are to go further here? First of all, we need to develop a, a cope-oriented backlog uh, together with the whole core team. Uh, we need to look very carefully at the tasks we are currently working on and see if they actually fit into, into such a concept and, and look, at, um, look at what's needed um, furthermore. And also we need to um, make product strategy integral uh, an integral part of the actual sprints. So we can't just um, have all of our great developers just work in all kinds of directions. We need to really focus on the product strategy and, and keep improving that. So where should NIAS be in about one year from now? Some of the very key components here that are needed in order to become a Coke CMS would be to have a content API so that we're able to use NIOS to create content and then spit it out to many different publishing systems, to InDesign publishing systems if you want uh, to use it for print or send it to Drupal or to, con to whatever uh, systems you want to use to actually output the content. Um, also, we need a content modeling UI so that you don't always need integrators to build up new content types or change them. That's also an important part. And we need more structured editing, definitely, that's lacking in NIAS uh, now and on, on the top list on our roadmap. Um, and last uh, is the curation tools. If you have external content coming in from a, a video management system, for example, then you need interfaces in NIAS to actually pick and choose the different videos you want when you are curating. And then? And then? Whenever two people with ideas get worked up about it too much, there is a good old European tradition, and that is to write a manifesto. And um, so that's what we did. And um, so unless uh, you're now tired of theory, here's more theory for you. And um, yeah, we try to actually think about Culp and putting all the things that it means when you think it through to the bitter end, more or less in one rather shortish article. It's a beta, so we're still working on it, and, um, but you're invited, or we'd be really glad if you took a look at it, and um, gave us feedback, joined the conversation. It took us some time, and um, thank you very, very much for holding out at this time of day, after such a long day, and um, yeah, looking forward to having a beer with you finally. Thank you. Are there any questions to the both of them concerning COPE and the future of NEOS? Anything? Remarks, questions, <coughs> feedback, 
The word beer has been said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you didn't want to have any questions, right? So I'm, really? fi I'm fine with questions. But otherwise, there are none. Otherwise we'll just go ahead and create this monster. <laughs> Yeah, the so there's already the content up there on CodeManifesto.org? Pardon me? There is already content behind that yes. URL, so yeah. maybe we have questions after it, we read that. So. But it's not created with me, yes. It's not? No. <laughs> well, that's a shame. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Daniel, Rasmus. Give them a hand. Thanks. That was great. Oh, yes. oh I'm sorry. There's one question. I have one question. No beer. <laughs> One question. Hi. So um, my question is, um, I see that it's a, it's a very uh, specific um, direction that you're going. Can, uh, uh, are you thinking as well about using NEOs still as a more generic thing where you can just kind of ignore a bit that side of uh, multi-dimensional content and so on? Yeah, uh, I think I, I can answer that. Um, so with the different, different editing modes we have with NEOS, since that is, is configurable, you can configure a version of NEOS where you only see the in-place editing as your editing mode, or you don't see it at all, you just use that. You don't even need to use the preview central if you don't want to. So, and then you just actually use it as a site builder. That would be just like uh, a version of Squarespace in, instead of, of the whole uh, complex uh, machinery uh, being used. So definitely, it's been thought about in, in that way so that you would, should be able to configure it in many different ways. And, and we didn't want to, from the start uh, with 1.0, we, we didn't want to um, be too biased about what kind of editing mode you wanted to use. Uh, so that should depend on the project and the client and the editor type you're working with. So definitely we're not going to uh, lose that flexibility just because we'd like to push the product in this direction. Does that answer? That's great, thank you. Okay.